spoke of occupation, of uh, what the people are doing, and uh, how it was this kind of permanent aspect of the portrait that was added to the idea of, uh, of depicting an individual. So the, this time we'll make the same type of reasoning, but with, with the notion of class. And I must tell you in beginning, maybe it will, it will be shown in the way it will develop this thing. I had a lot of trouble to, to clarify ideas about this specific lecture. I wanted to start with the a quotation of a French philosopher called Alain Finkelkraut. I don't know if, if you have heard of him. Uh, he made the wonderful book, very well written, and, but very also powerful, uh, about uh, l'humanité perdue, uh, la pensée uh, défaite, etc. And the, he have a quotation about the, what he called the proletarian um, state. Uh, the, the state of workers, and uh, I would just quote a kind of uh, difficult translation of that, but anyway, to, to give you an idea of what he means. He says, unlike other men from the present or the past, the proletarian cannot in any case identify himself with the determination imparted to him by the epoch, by the society, or by the nation. The epoch is bourgeois, uh, uh, is native land, the artificial, is a, the artificial community to which he is asked to sacrifice his own interests for the sake of the established order. And since long, his work is no more a craft. Extradited from every condition, including his own, shut out from all prerogatives, the proletarian has, however, the ontological privilege to be just a man or just a human, if you want. Alienated from the world, he is, by the same token, saved from all the alienation where men fall when they take themselves for something else than they are, really they are. <laughs> okay. the, what I want to do is to test this idea here with my corpus. Huh? Basically, what, what Frank Finkelkraut uh, uh, suggests is this. He says, if you want to, to represent, really, uh, the proletarian class, let's say, or the really the poorer uh, aspect of, of our society, you must renounce to uh, any determination to come from the nation, for instance, the fact that they are Canadian or French or German, because after all, workers on this all look alike, uh, are all, and he is very critical, of course, you notice of this idea of that the nation for them is just something that asks to sacrifice their own life to uh, maintain the established order. Yeah? And also, you have to eliminate any, anything who deals with uh, uh, the, the society in which you are, or the epoch in which you are, because after all, this condition of proletarian uh, start very, very early in history. Yeah? You, you have, uh, even uh, in Egypt, uh, <laughs> people were building the pyramids, and so they, they were proletarian, I guess. And uh, also, finally, the, all the determination that comes from the work itself, because the work that the proletarian do today are, in fact, not a craft, not a métier, huh? something that is repetitive, that uh, has not too much meaning uh, as itself. It's just a part of, on a kind of a long line of uh, other workers who are do each one is little parts. Huh? So in that sense, and finally, he says, well, with all this removed from the picture, if you want, from the image we make of them, what is left? It's humanity as such. Huh? So uh, for, for painters, this is very, for philosopher, this is very nice, but for painters, this is not so easy. Huh? How do you do uh, this kind of elimination of all these aspects, and on the other hand, that you keep uh, this idea of, of humanity? So you will see today two strategies around this, this theme. The first one I want to, uh, to, uh, to illustrate with, it's uh, Jean-Paul Lemieux. Uh, you know a little bit his, uh, his painting, you have seen his thing, and uh, here is his self-portrait, if ever you have never seen uh, Jean-Paul Lemieux. This is him uh, when he was 70 years old, and uh, he put himself uh, with two other images of himself, I would say. You have a little boy on the left who is him when he was uh, a child, and you have him also on the right uh, when he was, uh, I would say, an adolescent. Uh, and then he put on the wall behind him two of his famous pictures. 
uh, one with the visitor du soir, like the one in the middle, if you want, uh, that shows a man uh, uh, difficult to describe because he has have no face whatsoever, and he's in an immense landscape like this of snow and a gray sky. And the other one on the top is another one who's, who's, who's called the, the Cavalier Perdu, or something like, like the lost uh, uh, horseman, let's say. And both of them deal with death. Both paintings deal with death. Because the visitor du soir is, in fact, a priest who brings the last uh, sacrament to somebody uh, nearby, I guess, or, or not so nearby, because we don't really see anything around. It's really completely empty. And the, the horse uh, the, the horse lost like this in a landscape, this is a kind of traditional symbol also of death. And, well, maybe Le Mieux at 70 becomes to think a little bit that his life is, is not over, but uh, it's time to reflect uh, what, what will happen a little bit later. And also it's a time for him of many retrospective. Uh, like in 1974, there was a big retrospective of Le Mieux. There was a film make on him. So all this making more or less like, okay, this is to... It's a nice way to finish everything and to close, close it up. Uh, and uh, when, when we think of Lemieux, the, the, f the first, uh, and about the, the, the type of problem I was asking myself at the beginning, I, I said, with, with Lemieux, we have first the, the impression that this is the, the, the painter Quebecois par excellence. Huh? We, and, and he was, described like this all the time, you know, the, uh, for instance, I, I just find a few quotes of journalists of the time. One would speak of uh, Lemieux as the perfect Quebecois painters who really represent what we are, our solitude and, and this kind of emptiness of our landscape, etc. Another will say that uh, can he, French can even uh, identify with the personage of Lemieux. They, they, they find themselves, uh, they recognize themselves in this personage. Uh, the, um, we will speak also, we will create about Lemieux a kind of neologism. We will speak of Canadianitude uh, to start, like the, the fact to be Canadian. And soon enough, of course, you will have Quebecitude also, well, or to be a, uh, the, the typical Quebecois entity. Uh, and even some uh, uh, minister of culture like Monsieur Tremblay, Jean-Noël Tremblay, speak of him as really uh, describing the, the, the soul of the French Canadian and all that. And uh, well, this, is, uh, this is very nice, but if it, if it was true, the, uh, what Finkelkraut suggests will not apply to Lemieux. Uh, because if he is precisely describing his personage or, and his, the surrounding, as typically Quebecois and only Quebecois, then you, you don't have the, this undeterminated uh, aspect that, uh, that he was describing in which you don't have nation, you don't have epoch, you don't have craft, or you don't have the, the work as a way to determine exactly what your personage is. You want to bring it to a more uh, general level. Uh, and in, indeed, sometimes, in some declarations, Lemieux seems to uh, give in to this type of description. Uh, he would say, for instance, I don't understand that a painter who was born in Chicoutimi will speak like somebody who was born near the Mediterranean. Well, it's a good question, uh, but maybe he doesn't care if Chicoutimi too much around. He wants to make uh, something more with sun and things like that. But meaning that we should reflect in our painting, let's see, the spirit of the place. Huh? And, and I think... That's more or less what, what Lemieux suggested there. It is that uh, we should start with what is around us. Uh, but is it so crucial to him that you will define him only through this? And this is where I have my doubt. For instance, he says also that he, he didn't understand why people stress so much his Quebec affinities. Uh, he says, after all, what I paint could have been also in Russia or in Norway or in any Scandinavian country where you have snow, when you have a kind of flat landscape like we have here in Quebec. And he says, why to, to, put, to, to, give, to put myself uh, absolutely in this category of a Quebecois uh, uh, painter? He says, je n'ai jamais compris pourquoi on m'a considéré le peintre Quebecois par excellence. I never understood why the con everybody considered me as the the uh, Quebecois painter by excellence. Huh? And uh, he, almost to give him a uh, reason on this, 
he had a tremendous success when his paintings were shown both in Russia and in Czechoslovakia at the time in Prague, let's say. And uh, you, not only we know that by hearsay, but we have also kept the uh, book of visitors you know, in which people wrote their impression. And all of them are very positive. They recognize themselves in this landscape. They see the alienation of man and they make comments like this who, are, who seems that even if have nothing to do with Quebec, and they, they find something more profound here. And I think this is really what will be the key of Lemieux, this kind of mixture between keeping some particularism of uh, you recognize Quebec landscape, you recognize Quebec personage and all that on one hand, but on the other hand, trying to go deeper than that and almost, I would say, um, uh, not lying, but uh, not giving us the real clue when we start only with the Quebec attitude, with the Quebec dimension of it. If you don't see the other dimension, then you miss uh, what I think for Lemieux was most, more important. I would say that these clues that he kept uh, very clearly, so there's no doubt, of, of this kind of Quebecois landscape and Quebecois personnage are uh, superficial, are what we see first in the surface. But his real intention is more profound than that. He wants, like Finkelkraut was suggesting, to get to humanity, to get to a, a more human type of problem. Uh, okay, so he had made some uh, real portrait, I would say, not too many, and uh, they are not the, the most interesting part of his work, like this one of uh, a portrait of Paul VI, of uh, one of the Pope uh, that didn't stay too much, uh, happily, because the only thing he wrote about it was the limitation of uh, birth, of the contraception. He was against, of course. Uh, and, uh, the, uh, and he made this kind of strange portrait, of course, with this black background. Is it to say that uh, the Pope was the enemy of, uh, of the blackness, <laughs> or is it the one who bring it? I, I'm not sure. There's a kind of ambiguity here that we cannot really solve. And, uh, but there's one portrait that he made in which we can uh, recognize ourselves maybe better. This is this one with a, an homage to Nelly Gant. Nelly Gant is a French uh, Canadian poet of uh, the beginning of this century. Uh, and uh, you have a photo of him on the right, and you see that uh, uh, Lemieux have take his inspiration from that photo for sure. Uh. And uh, in this painting, of course, uh, this is very typical of Lemieux. You have two levels. The first level is, is very familiar. You recognize Nelligan. Uh, this is him. He just had a kind of um, a top hat, a kind of funny hat on the top of his head. But this is right away somebody that any uh, student of uh, French Canadian literature will recognize. Uh, and then the, the place where he stands is the Carré Saint-Louis, uh, near in Montreal here. And uh, again, it's familiar. It's uh, even the gray sky, I would say, is familiar also during the winter. This is the first aspect. And then the more you look at it, the more strange it becomes. For instance, what exactly this poet is doing here? So he's doing strictly nothing, in fact. He doesn't walk toward us. He doesn't uh, re recede in space. He's just standing there. His hands are dangling on his side. And he, he's completely inactive. He seems lost in his thought. And he's not aware of uh, this nice person on the right uh, that maybe tried to contact him. Maybe it's, uh, it's his inspiration or that. No, he's just there. And the more you look at it, the more you get this kind of strange feeling of, uh, I would say, almost like uh, this notion of uh, um Heinrich Keit that Freud has developed, you know, about, for instance, any confrontation with a, with a double with like, a, uh, for instance, a wax mu museum uh, double. You will have, it's very realistic, you, it looks familiar, and then suddenly because it doesn't move, it doesn't change, uh, it doesn't do anything, you become to be on at ease with it. Uh, and this is the second level of the Lemieux picture that uh, you have the familiar one, and then suddenly you have the more strange, more worris worrisome, I would say, uh, aspect of it. And this will be, you will see, constant in all picture by Lemieux. We have always these two levels. Uh, uh, let's say, for instance, in that one, was built exactly on the same type of uh, opposition that we had in the homage to an elegant. Here's a winter time, le temps d'hiver. Uh, and so you have two kids 
who are typical uh, Quebecois kids, I would say, the, uh, with the toque and, and their big uh, fur coat and all that, or, or their sweaters, in front of a landscape was probably what you see from Quebec City when you look toward the Ile d'Orléans. Yeah? It's about that landscape, and of course during the winter with the, and with the assumption that the, the river is completely frozen there, which is not true, but anyway, it make it more dramatic, more simple like that. And so the, the first impression is that it's familiar, it's two kids in front of a landscape that more or less we recognize. But then again, what are these kids are doing? Huh? Are there any communication between them? Uh, are they, is it really what Lemieux tried to suggest, that there's a kind of alienation between them? It doesn't seem so. They seem just being there, in a way, uh, without doing nothing and just affirming their presence, in a way. And this is, I think it's important also because then you see which kind of definition is about when he speak of uh, trying to represent humanity as such. Uh, and humanity is reduced to a pure presence. Maybe with one more aspect, it is that these kids are looking and they are looked at. And maybe this space of, of, uh, of the gaze, if you want, uh, is w where we are standing now. This is exactly what, what Lemieux is about. It's trying to define, let's say, the humanity as a pure presence and something who take, I would say, some existence by the fact that it is looked at. Uh, anybody needs consideration or acknowledgement, I would say, but, uh, and, and, but it's so basic that you could say, well, this is a way to define humanity. Uh, the fact that we need acknowledgement, that we need to, con like uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau used to say, consideration, uh, exactly that, it's exactly the same word, than acknowledgement, to, uh, to be seen, it's to exist. Uh, and maybe that's one of the uh, dimensions uh, by which uh, Lemieux reached this more general theme, let's say. The, the, the familiar aspect is the, the quebecitude, if you want, but the more general theme of humanity is dealt that way. And here you see it almost at the, in, in a pure state. Okay, again, the landscape is recognizable. It is the, uh, the rock with Quebec City that you see in the back from Lévis, let's say. And now you have only one personage who's standing always inactive, always with, with the dangling hands. And here more, you have one more aspect also that is noticeable. It is, he is backlighted. Huh? The, when you have a, a very clear background like this and you are standing in front, habitually it's a people who take photography which says, no, no, turn around, we have to have the sun on you because otherwise they will see nothing. But there in the country, Lemieux chose that. He chose to show the personage backlighted light like this in order that even his expression will be difficult to read. Huh? You don't know exactly what he's thinking. You don't know even if he's young or old or even the sex is undetermined. Is it a woman, is it a man? It's not so clear. Right? It's difficult even to choose that. So you get by generalizing like that to, to, to the very core, I would say, of a, uh, the word that comes to me, it's a, the word that the Heidegger will use, a Dasein. A Dasein means to be there. Uh, that, that's what, what the personage of Lemieux is. He's just there. Uh, and it's not important that he's male or female, old or, or young, or, or, or for that matter, Quebecois or not. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the, the first impression we get when you see many of these pictures, it is, the, and, and it's a good question because uh, if you think of what we were discussing last time, it is, did Lemieux make a choice here, maybe, if, uh, because he just liked this type of landscape and all that, but make a choice for, I would say, a more a peasant culture instead of a urban one. Uh, it's true that the city is very far or in, uh, or in existence, and the personage there could be uh, indeed a, an habitant, and uh, kind of uh, somebody close to uh, the traditionalist view that we saw last time, you see, of Massicotte or uh, La Liberté or Suzor Côté, uh, you remember. Could, he, could the personage of Lemieux could be descendant, let's say, of the 60s and the 70s of these old guys, you see, that we're seeing last time? Where, or even worse, are they uh, a little bit, uh, 
out of time, you know, like uh, it's no more the fashion. Lemieux, you should understand. Nobody live like that anymore. Cesar Codé, c'est passé de mode, and c'est fini. Alors, do something else, do something more modern than that. And you could say, well, you could make an argument with this because you have also, oh yeah, I forgot this one. This was an extraordinary one because it's an exception that confirmed the rule, if you want. It's called the, the adieu. Uh, so you have two personages who seems to be in a certain interaction here. But what exactly are they doing? Are they kissing? Are they speaking to each other? Are they telling each other, go to hell, I don't want to see you anymore? We, we, have, we have no idea. It, it's, uh, and look carefully, even maybe the one in, in front, uh, the closer to us is a man, maybe the other is a woman, but not even that is very clear. Huh? And in fact, I say it's an exception to confirm the rule since he called it the adieu. And because of that, of course, the next step will be the separation, will be the isolation, will be solitude. Uh, uh, just after that, they will go each one in his direction, and that was it. Uh, and uh, OK. I was so then asking the question, what about the, the rural aspect of these personages? Are they, uh, at least they are in outdoor space. Uh, Maybe they are not completely rural. They are not working, of course, uh, because uh, this is eliminated. But are they, how they situate themselves uh, in comparison with a city? And we know that uh, Lemieux had very often uh, said things as rather negative about the city. He have even entertained the fancy to, um, to paint a city completely empty of inhabitants. I kind of like almost like you have here in the city covered by snow. Maybe you have a few little personages at the foreground in, in the bottom of the picture, but most of it seems completely empty. Uh, he have also even went further than that and, and make a, a, a picture, it's called The Aftermath. The, the title is given in English and, and in French also La Ville Détruite, in which uh, he imagined a city after uh, an atomic bomb uh, had destroyed everything, and that is what's left, no inhabitant whatsoever. So very often, you will have in Lemieux picture this kind of uh, negative uh, view of the city. Huh? Or uh, like this one that I like best, it's called La Cité Lointaine. Alors, the, 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 the city is good if it's far, <laughs> if it's uh, on the other side of the hill there. And in the front, you have this big, uh, big hill that have created that. But, okay, being, this being said, on the other hand, you have also very often in, in the, well, when Lemieux described his discovery of the landscape, or the Quebec landscape, it, it, it seems uh, paradoxical to speak of discovery since he's born in Quebec and he should have seen it right away. But he says that he, he discovered the landscape as he painted it now after 1956, let's say, and, and during the 60s and 70s, uh, when after a trip in Europe, he went in Europe for one year, 19, uh, 1955, and when he came back, he says, I was struck by the horizontality of Quebec. He says, I never noticed that before. And he says, it's true that you have to go out of your country to see it differently and to, to suddenly see things that uh, nobody had noticed before. Uh, even, I would say, very often tourists see things that we don't see. Huh? How many of you went to the Oratoire Saint-Joseph? You know, I went very recently because my son, who lives in Israel and come here and says, what is this big church? What is, oh, come on, I, I don't want to go there. And, and he, he bring me there and suddenly I realize the tourists will be curious of things that we are not because we live here and we don't notice that. Uh, so it's possible that getting out of his country, coming back, he have a, a, this kind of touristic attitude toward it and see things that he have not seen. But that means also that the position of Lemieux in front of the landscape is one of a visitor. And then the, the problem of being from the country or from the city becomes very irrelevant. Uh, you, you visit the country. You are, you, maybe you come from the city, maybe you come from the country, doesn't matter. And uh, because the way you see it, the way you see it is the one is with the eye of something with a visitor. And indeed, you have this painting that was shown, say, Le Visiteur du Soir. You have in some of his painting this title. And he even make one who's called La Visite. Huh? Uh, this is a kind of a, 
um, regular things that happen to any, any home, French Canadian home, you get la visite. Uh, and uh, this, these are, it seems very funny people. Uh, they, they, it's like the things that you, oh my God, are hardy. And, and okay, you see them coming toward you, but we have no idea of the interaction with the, with, with the other people. We, I'm, I'm projecting my own problem, <laughs> looking at the picture, and said, oh my God, if they come. And, and, but, but uh, of course, uh, Lemieux didn't give us anything. But I think is, what is interesting here is to keep that in mind, that his attitude is the one of a visitor. And also, in fact, he demolished then the whole polarity between the country and the city. Uh, that was so important for people like Suzor Cote and, and La Liberté and uh, the people we were looking at last time. And for them, this was crucial. And for Abbé Grou also, all these people who said, the real roots of, of the culture here is in the country and the city is, dim is, uh, is terrible, it's a place of alienation and all that. Lemieux could say that also, but when he defined his position in front of the landscape is the one of a visitor. The one with a certain detachment, I would say, with a certain distance with it. Uh, OK. So with this in mind, what happens now to, uh, say I spoke of the personage of Lemieux up to now. What about the portrait as such in Lemieux? Uh, uh, at a certain point, uh, well, this is early one, in uh, 1957, he may have entertained the idea of creating type, a typical type, like the orphelin here, the orphan. Uh, uh, the orphan, of course, was uh, very typical of, uh, let's say, of a society in which uh, there was no contraception because the Catholic Church was against it, and uh, with huge family, and uh, very often with mothers who died uh, giving birth, and with fathers who have no, uh, no money to, to spend to, to keep the children, so they were giving them to the orphelina. Uh, th these are huge structure that now uh, may be used for other purpose. But if you look uh, in the landscape of Quebec, you will find many of those orphelina. Uh, uh, I think it came, of course, uh, it's a kind of uh, a bad aspect of a uh, crazy uh, politics of natality that the church had at the time, you see, pushing. Uh, it's paradoxical. They were condemning sexual pleasure, but pushing big family. And for me, the two things goes together. But anyway, they, they, they were trying to, to put these two things together. So the orphelin could have been, in that sense, a kind of type, and typical of a, and uh, of course, the, the, the let's see, the, uh, the hope of life and of success of these poor uh, kids were, were terrible, uh, because especially when they were not very beautiful or not very smart, like this one seems to be, uh, they, they were doomed to, to and that was a possibility for, for Lemieux to develop. But you will see, he will try to go even further than that. And right away, the more typical portrait of Lemieux will be like the one on the left. Of course, not on the Pisanello that I want to put beside. What happened, it is as if he reduced, he even tried to go further in generality, in universality, if you want, than the type, than a stereotype. Huh? Not even that. Not even an orphelin or a, a worker or whatever, uh, a little bit like Holgate tried to do last time. Right? You, you remember Holgate was, was doing like this types, if you want. But here we go even further, we and he called this thing portrait. Huh? And this is interesting because then it doesn't suggest any name of woman, any uh, personage whatsoever. It's just a portrait as such. And indeed, him who claimed that the painter of Chicoutimi should not paint like a Mediterranean is always very interested in Italian uh, early Quattrocento type of painting, like, like this Pisanello here that you see a young lady. Um, she, apparently, she was uh, of the family of uh, Deste and was killed by her husband when she was 22 years old by some poison. I guess this is, goes with the mafia of the time, you know. The, and, and, and that's why she, she is represented with uh, these flowers in the back as if her youth was uh, uh, spoiled rapidly. And also the butterflies, very often uh, butterflies associa are associated with the death of young people uh, in, in the early picture like that. Her costume is, is very elaborated and very beautiful. And when you put the two uh, painting together, you, you see that Lemieux suggests almost a kind of a radically 
<laughs> the simplified version of what the Pisan Hello was. He removed everything in the background, and there's nothing. There's even a small line of horizon, very low here at the bottom. I don't know if you can see it here. And uh, a row of perils and uh, a little hat, and that's it, you know. Almost no, no costume whatsoever to, to stress, uh, and again, the same immobility. And also, even I would see here, the choice of profile to show the, the personality in profile also means that even to be looked at seems less interesting or less important if in that case. Huh? So you, always you get this kind of, uh, uh, this attempt to generalize a picture, to go deeper and deeper to a kind of uh, pure human presence, I would say. Huh? You, you follow me with this. Uh, he will do the same, uh, the same way, I would say, with, with portrait of children. Uh, like the one you see on the left, Le Petit Pierre, well, it's, uh, it's rare that he give names also, and never full name, always uh, first name like here, or the red sweater in the other case, and, uh, or facing you, or in profile like this, always very generalized, very simplified. Uh, the interest in childhood also is a, could be noticed uh, because a child is not very determined. Uh, it's not an adult. You don't know exactly where he will go, uh, what he will become. And it's fascinating because of that, because he's full of potential. Uh, and maybe because of that, uh, Lemieux thought that we are even closer to a humanity who is not really defined, who is not really uh, this or that. Uh, we are uh, like beyond all these determination that will come with time. Uh, and in, indeed, many, most of the picture of, uh, who could be classified as portrait in Jean-Paul Lemieux, are children, are women, very few men, uh, uh, old people sometimes, but very few adult men. Uh, and I think that he goes to the margin, let's say, of society like children uh, and try to, oh my God, I will be killed by feminist here. I said the margin of <laughs> <laughs> With the, uh, I, you, you notice I, I mentioned just the children after, but the, uh, and the, uh, it goes to the, these people who are exploited or, or, or let's say pushed down uh, in the society. And, and uh, but there's no social protest here. Uh, there's no issue about their status. They are just standing there. They're just put there. Uh, they're just uh, presented there. Uh. I, even with, with these two portraits of kids, they are almost evanescent. Huh? You all, they are white on white on white, and you, you see just their eyes and uh, almost nothing else. Huh? And uh, the, uh, let's say the, maybe the, uh, the, the, the summary of all that for, for Lemieux was this picture which is called uh, Julie and the Universe. Huh? Uh, he doesn't say Julie and Quebec and something like that. It's Julie really in the universe. So she's a child, but uh, grown up a little bit and in front of uh, this kind of completely flat horizon without any, any particularism that you could imagine. Uh, and, and this is exactly the type of balance that he's looking for. To keep some of the particularism of Quebec that uh, uh, Quebecois auditoire or public will recognize, but on the other hand, to deal with the presence, with humanity as a presence, uh, as such. Later in his career, he, he have made, I would say, almost an anxious version of the, of the Julie and universe. It's called Towards the Cosmos, Tournée vers le Cosmos, again, the, 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 the empty night and all that. It, it, at the end of his life, he began to give more I would say emotion in this picture. Uh, um, up, to, up to now, there was none in a way. Huh? They, they, these faces are completely like poker face. You cannot see really what they think. But at the end, he began to add a little bit, some element of emotion, but, but without changing basically his point of view. Huh? Okay, so this is uh, the first part of my demonstration. I wanted then to explore two, two Jewish artists who have to deal with the same problem in a way, but in a di very different way. Uh, they are dealing also with this idea of uh, showing the popular class, let's say the proletarians, but revealing also their humanity, uh, a little bit like in the text of Finkelkraut I was quoting at the beginning, but without keeping this particularism of Quebec like you have in Lemieux, 
and on the other hand, with giving much more individuality to the personage that they are representing and not uh, having this kind of very general look that we have in Lemieux. Uh, the first one is, I've been presented here uh, last year as uh, uh, Sam Borenstein. It is a, a self-portrait of him with his wife, on Judith, on, on the left and his father, Simcha, on the top there. And, uh, uh, we are to, and he represented himself in a kind of very harsh color. You see, he's a phobist. You know, <laughs> he wants to to show that uh, he is not a naturalist. Wanted just to paint uh, wh what he looks. And it seems also that the little landscape that you have in the back was his ambition at the time. He wanted to quit portrait painting and really deal with landscape and with this famous uh, representation of uh, French Canadian village uh, in the north of, uh, in the region of Saint Agathe and, and these places. But the, the painting I wanted to attract your attention on is this one. It's called uh, Chief McCabe, and uh, it represents, of course, a, a cook, but also apparently he was the owner of the restaurant, who is called Au Lutin qui Bouffe. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if you, some of you uh, remember that restaurant. It was on St. Hubert Street. And uh, the guy had this kind of curious idea to, kept, to keep on the premises a little piglet. And uh, when people came away with a family, they had a snapshot taken with a piglet, you know, giving him. Uh, and last time, when I gave this lecture in French uh, about one month and a half ago, one of the lady there, uh, who was in the, the public, brought me a picture uh, taken there, uh, au lutin qui bouffe, in 1945, where she is the little girl, and uh, you see the little piglet there, alive, of course. It's a big, very risky in a restaurant, this thing, <laughs> both for the public and for the piglet also, because he may end up in the, in the dish. But uh, the... <laughs> And, and, and people were photographed like that, and, and then it was written on, on the bottom, au lutin qui bouffe, with, with a date, and it was a kind of souvenir that people could. My luck, it was that uh, this lady kept this souvenir so long to, to bring it to me in the, uh, in the lecture. So if, if you go back to Mr. McCabe, okay, the, he was apparently a very nice man also. He, he was hiring some artists to, to be waiter at his restaurant and helping them that way. Um, but he finished his life tragically because he had a gun. And this is not always a good idea to when you are an old guy with a gun and you have two huge thieves that come to you, just remove the gun from your hand and shoot you instead. And uh, he was killed like this. He, he died tragically. And, uh, but then the question I was asking, what is exactly the difference between this depiction here and the one we saw in Lemieux? And the first thing that struck me, it is that you don't have here any uh, characterization taken from the nation, from the, uh, the epoch, or from the, uh, the, the, maybe the work that he's doing because he's dressed like a, like a, a cook. Huh? But he's not working at the moment. He's just posing in front of the painter. Huh? On one hand, so this seems to be closer to what Finkelkraut was suggesting that the real proletarian is the one in which you cannot have any determination coming from the epoch, from the nation, or from the work. Uh, and on the other hand, the, the, the face of the personage is much more individualized than in Lemieux. Uh, Lemieux are, is going toward a very generalized type of personage in which you could say that it could fit to anybody at the end. Here, in the contrary, it is Mr. Maccabee. It is a specific personage, uh, maybe nice or not nice anyway, but you, you, you have a relationship with somebody very individualized. And if I wanted to characterize these two approaches, I would say that the Lemieux approach is metaphysical. What he's about is the, the being. Huh? And Bornstein approach, and you would say also of Moorstock that I will speak after, are ethical. Yeah. What they are representing, it's not a generalized figure. It's a face. Yeah. And a face that is vulnerable. 
that is looking at you and making some demand on you. And the demand, the demand that uh, this face makes on, on us, let's say, is ethical, right? is about justice, is about the, the way to behave. Some of them you will see are much more demanding. Here, okay, you could say I'm an owner of a restaurant, I want clients and all that, but also I'm an individual who, have, who, will, who will end his life dramatically and all that. So this face is not only a generalized picture, but it's also something that will create an encounter uh, with us. And I think this is the big difference between this more detached, metaphysical type of approach that you have in Lemieux and that we will have here and also in Mulstock picture. Okay. Uh, one of the, the avowed, uh, let's say, uh, admiration of Bornstein was for this uh, painter who's called Chaim Soutin, uh, who was active in France and uh, died, if I remember well, during the war in 1943 or something like that. He was heavily collected by uh, the Barnes collection in Philadelphia. Uh, I don't know why Mr. Barnes lo loves Soutine and he bought 46 of them uh, in one shot. And all that. And, and, but uh, let's see, he's a, he's a French Jewish painter who have been attracted to this type of character like this, like uh, a pastry cook, let's say, but young pastry cook, people who are, not, who are exploited but are too young to really realize it. Uh. They have habitually huge ears. I think you, you see on the one on the left. And, and uh, why? Because they are more uh, to listen than to speak. <laughs> they are there to do what they are told to do and not to. Uh, and uh, he, he have also uh, created a personage like a coir boil, let's see, on the left, and the groom on, on, on the right. Always the same type of uh, very, very marginal type of worker. Uh, very much exploited. Uh, these kids were working for, uh, let's say, uh, the, uh, the kind of uh, cook or thing like that, orders for the church and order for the hostelry. And each time they are in a big system in which they are frail and in, uh, they have not too much to defend. And I stress that because then we are getting to more ethical type of problem uh, with this type of picture. Because they are there they, they, they don't seem to claim anything, but on the other hand, when you re reflect a little bit what it is to, to be a groom in a big hotel, uh, you, you carry a valise and you, you try to smile to everybody, and, but you don't make money there, you, you, and you have terrible hours. You could be uh, wake up in the middle of the night and all this. There's a kind of an exploitation there that is blatant. And you could see that these faces, one after the other, with all their crookedness and all their expressionist type of uh, approach, are there to, to demand attention, at least, huh, to the and uh, Okay. The other painter of, of Canada that uh, I wanted to, to show you also, it is uh, Louis Moulstock. And with Moulstock, I think we have also a, a clear case of what I'm telling you about this more ethical type of approach to the personage. Uh, here is a self-portrait of him uh, as a, he says, a younger man. Since he lived uh, up to his 90s, I think he knows what he's speaking about. And uh, he, he, he presents himself like this with a kind of uh, little abstract uh, background, but looks determined. He has his palette and foreground. This is the, the way typical to, to show a, a self-portrait, let's say, by a painter. Huh? And... Uh, here, uh, some, maybe some of you have known Mulstock. Uh, uh, this is more the Mulstock I've, I've met myself uh, when he was an older guy. He was spending a lot of time feeding all the birds and the animals around his studio. He have a studio on Saint Famille Street near where La Liberté have his studio that I showed you last time. And uh, very, very nice man, very sweet man. Uh, friendly with everybody around him. And as a matter of fact, you ask yourself how he could uh, have um, people uh, uh, posing for him naked, even pregnant women. Only Mulstock can, could do that, you know, to, with his nice way to, could I make a picture of you? And uh, uh, slowly, uh, <laughs> slowly you end up uh, without your shirt. And <laughs> <laughs> And we'll start make a, one of his famous nude. Okay. Well, I start with this picture, I think, which is almost a, a, good, a, a good example of, of what I, I'm telling you. 
It's called Evelyn Pleasant, Clark Street, uh, Montreal. And right away, the title is striking because you have, for the first time here, a name. Huh? In Lemieux, the, as far as you could go, is Petit Pierre uh, or Julie. Uh, you have first name, but here you have the full name of the girl, Evelyn Pleasant, Pleasant on, and where she lived, Clark Street. That means uh, she's a neighbor of Moulstock. He saw her probably uh, by one of his walk, uh, walking around and finding suddenly this little girl. And he, uh, okay, again, this is also the childhood theme, huh, like we had in Lemieux. But here is a child that seems to look at you and is defined only by our future, not by our present, like in Lemieux. The, the, the children in Lemieux are there, uh, in, in the present tense, I would say. But here's this one look at the future, and the future is doomed. It, it's not nice. It, it, it will be difficult if you don't help, if you don't answer. Uh, and so that means that the relationship between the painter and the kid here is an encounter. Uh, it's an event. It's not just a look. It's something more than that. And we know that Moussak got involved with his model like this and he gave them uh, food and he bring them to the studio and feed them. He, he was a very compassionate man. And sometimes people, uh, some of his friends, you see, were interested in politics, uh, reproach him to be not politically involved enough. Uh, uh, especially in the Jewish community in the 30s and the 40s when he was active, there was a lot of uh, leftist people and communists and all that. And, and Mulstak never got really interested in politics, but he got interested in, in, in uh, moral, in ethic. Uh, and it's another level. I think it's, uh, in fact, it's more, I think it's more profound. But anyway, it, it's interesting that he kept that level all the time. Uh, and then uh, you, 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 I could, Summarize the uh, this. Uh, I have a nice quotation here again of this uh, of uh, of Finkelkraut, but he, he summarized there the thought of uh, Levinas, uh, who is another French philosopher, uh, who, who is dead now. But uh, anyway, it's, it's something must happen to the ego in order for for him to stop being just a happy so and so and begin to feel concern. Uh, and this event. This dramatic term of Evans is the encounter of somebody else, or more precisely, the revelation of a face. And this is very important. Huh? The difference between what this kind of neutral type of portrait that you have in, in, in Lemieux and here, a face. Somebody who's, who is li really looking naked, I would say, in, his, in her face, not, not knowing exactly what will happen, but creating a kind of encounter with you. An encounter, not just knowledge, a revelation rather than unveiling. Uh, and, and this is exactly what we are dealing with, with Mulstock, uh, with this, kind of, this level of involvement, let's say, that asks from the spectator or from the painter, if you want, in front of this child of which we see the face. Uh, not only the child or kind of generalized idea of it, but a face. Uh, one step further. Joe Lavallee with a ball of soup. Okay, who is this guy? Okay, so this is a man that Moulstock have met on the street and uh, that he have followed in a refuge for unemployed people. Yeah. At the time, of course, uh, look at the date, 1931, 32, you are in the big uh, crash. Uh, the, the, it was, of course, the, the worst economic uh, situation in Canada and many places in the world. And uh, these poor guys, especially whole like him, end up without works, and they were kept in, in a place where, run by nuns, and it was called l'oeuvre de la soupe. Uh, why? Because that's what they had to eat there, uh, la soupe. Uh, so he, that's exactly his meal, uh, Joe Lavallee, with a ball of soup. Uh, so uh, with his gentle way, Moulstock approached him, and he, he, says, he says, it's funny, I look at you, and you look familiar to me. And uh, he says, okay, maybe, uh, yeah, wh what is difficult to understand also it is that he, he spot this guy among all the others. Uh, like in this uh, drawing of Moulstock, it's called The Last Supper, if you want, <laughs> like, um, but at the refuge for an employee and on a last meal ticket. And you see our man is there. Huh? I don't know if you spotted him. He's in the corner there somewhere. 
ici. Hein? The, Monsieur Lavalier with his bowl of soup. Là. And so it, it, it's already fantastic that he, he could find him there. But what's more strange, it is that Mursak said, I saw you somewhere, and he, he remembered that he looks like this bishop here, done by Suzor Cote, and who was in this museum. Uh, it's still here. <laughs> it's one of the uh, sculpture of Suzor Cote that we have in this museum. And Mursak, of course, I visited the Montreal Museum. After all, it's, uh, it's nearby and all this. And he says, is it possible that you look so much alike with this thing. And Monsieur Lavallee says, yes, I already posed for Suzor Cote. So, so there, was, there was a connection there. And not only he posed for Suzor Cote, but he knew that this type of work is paid. Huh? And Moulstock then could not just deal with this nice way <laughs> to <laughs> get undressed. <laughs> no, no, there this is paid. Huh? And for the, the whole guy being, of course, in the refuge like this, maybe it could buy cigarettes or whatever he needed to, to do. Yeah. And uh, the, the fact we know that not only Suzor Cote have made him a bishop, because the bishop in question, it, it's not a real bishop, it's a Joe Lavalle transformed in bishop. Huh? But you have two others drawings of the same guy taken uh, a little bit be much before than the, what uh, uh, Moulstock could do. One where it's called the, I would say, the peasant from Quebec, so it's kind of tied by itself. But the other, where you call him, uh, say the, the vagabond or the tramp, I would say he was almost uh, suggesting what will happen to him in the future. Huh? He was almost predicting what will happen to him. And the fact that the, the same face could be used for three things, for a bishop, for a tramp, and for a typical peasant of Quebec, is interesting also because that's what um, uh, uh, Cote was looking for. Eh? He was kind of trying to find a typical face of this or that and, and trying to, to create type like this. So there's a kind of strange circularity here between Mulstock and Cote, but for a completely different reason. And uh, one of the sweet things that uh, uh, Mulstock did a little bit later in 35, he made this Lino cuts and he he uh, repeat, of course, the same personage of Joe Lavallee, but he gave him a wife, huh? or, or at least a woman companion, let's say. And this, of course, would have been unthinkable at the nuns' place. Huh? The, the uh, man with man and woman with woman. Yeah, there's no way to, to put the two together, come on. And, uh, and so Mulstock now <laughs> had created uh, this uh, uh, special situation of it to, to to give, uh, to give the possibility for this old guy to, to have a, a companion like this, at least in, in the imagination. Yeah. The, uh, so if you, you see, okay, the little black girl that we saw before, the Evelyn Pleasant, well, it's a, it's a, I, I suggested it's a face that demand an encounter. You have also here the same type of situation, except now it's an adult, it's an old guy, it's more tragic maybe because there's no future for this man and uh, he needs just maybe some human companionship uh, and and you, you think uh, at first I told myself okay maybe this is as far as Mulstock could, could go but then he got interested in hospitals and he went to even more uh, troubled people like like for instance people um, under drug and completely uh, lost in terms of almost with a bad trip and, and uh, at the close to death, I would say. Huh? And he draw these people, like, like in the hospital, he had some friends who were doctors and he went to the, uh, 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 to the, um, uh, general, the Montreal General Hospital and he could sit in their room, you see, because they were more or less dying there and abandoned. But at a certain time, he was told of a very strange and particular case, the case of Paranka. And I will read to you how he described how he painted her and, uh, how, uh, and who she was. He said, she was brought to my attention at the time by a friend of ours who was a doctor. It was at the Montreal General Hospital. She was a patient who had been there for 14 years in a crib. She was 21 year old 
and weighed about 45 pounds. It was a pituary disease that reduced her to a skeleton. Paranka had no vision at all. Her eyes were wide open, and the nurse asked her to sit up. She was going to have her picture taken. And so she sat for five to 10 minutes, and then took the sheets and just covered her head completely and curled up like a little animal, sheltered. That was the end of it. I could not draw anymore. And I came back the next day, and I tiptoed in quietly. And when I began to draw, she heard the sound of the charcoal. See, when you draw with the charcoal, you make a sound on the paper. And so she recognized the sound. And she did the same thing again, just covered herself. And there was no more. I went back. I sat patiently again, moved further back from the cot where she was in and drew. And so for five or six sessions, I was able to come back and observe her, and I got to know the face. This is a kind of an incredible story, of course. But then again, you have the, uh, I would say, the, the same type of uh, reduction, let's say, of humanity to his, uh, to his very root. Uh, but on the other hand, always with a person, always with somebody, with a name. Of course, Paranka, is, we don't know the name of this uh, poor uh, woman. Uh, she was called that way, but even that he kept this, this, the way she was called is typical. Uh, it's not a generalized figure, it's a very particularized one, but it's also re reduced, I would say, to the very core of humanity and, and uh, expressed that way. Uh, uh, this is done in 32, uh, before, of course, the, the, the concentration camps of the Nazi and all that. Uh, it's much before. Uh, Murstock family were happy to leave uh, uh, Galicia, where they come from, in 1911, so they didn't go through the Holocaust and all that. But uh, I cannot not think of the Holocaust when I see a picture like that, because as if he was almost uh, seeing it in, in advance. Huh? Uh, the way, uh, what in the camp they used to call the Muselman. The Muselman is, is, is uh, somebody who's so worn out, who's so out of his wit, that uh, he doesn't care anymore to die or to live and just is a kind of living skeleton, if you want. Uh, this is like the ultimate. And when Primo Levi says, uh, well, these are the people who should be the witness of the Holocaust, but they, they are lost. And, and we survivor, he says, uh, are not the real uh, uh, witness of what happened. Uh, these people who die there. And OK, it's not that here, but in a way, it's almost a prediction of that. Uh, it's almost a way uh, to see it. After, when the 30s go on, Murstak will become to be interested in the unemployed uh, people. Uh, there, there was, for instance, in the Flesh, Flesher, Fletcher Fields, people were sleeping there and just losing their time because they have no jobs. And he will sketch uh, there these people, sometimes making uh, much more uh, elaborated type of sketch, like this portrait of William O'Brien, unemployed. Uh, again, a man completely uh, lost in his thought, but okay, looking at the future and not, uh, see, when you lose your capacity to work, you lose also so much of your definition uh, of what you are as, as a man or as a woman. And uh, then again, this is the type of uh, relationship that uh, Murstock was able to create uh, with his people. Uh, uh, when then after with the war, uh, the, of course, the, the people began to get employed and all that and work uh, in shipyards or for, for, the, for, the, for the war effort and all that. And, and then uh, Murstock accompany uh, the movement, if you want. He, he did a series of uh, welder like this or riveter uh, that, of course, then lose their face because they need this mask in front of them. And, uh, and the way to give them some individuality was interesting. Sometimes he, he, he succeeded to convince them to stop working a little bit, but the guy were not so eager to do that. They were, of course, uh, paid by, by the hours and all that, and they have to work. But on the other hand, they were happy to have their portrait taken to show them to their family, for instance. So, and, and Murstock will, or for instance here, show, um, a very difficult type of work in which only this guy could do it properly. So right away you could, you could recognize him. Or having a kind of very crooked type of position to, to, re, to make the riveting. 
Other time, it will really convince the people to lift their, their mask and, and to have their portrait painted, uh, like the welder on, on the left. And on the right, if you see on the right corner, you have a signature there. It's not the signature of Mulstock. It's the name of this guy. Yeah? He let him write on the picture his name. Yeah? And uh, in a way to, to identify him. And the last uh, way to, to do it was to keep the number, I, I don't know if you see it, on the box on which he's sitting here. You have the number 644. Yeah? And of course, he's the only one to have this number. So if you look at him, you cannot recognize anybody because he's covered with his, uh, with his uh, working suit and all that. But because of the number, you can say, oh, see, this is Joe Crow. Uh, it cannot be an idiot. Uh, this is the one with 644. Huh? And, each, and, and this is paradoxical because a number, habitually, is very impersonal. But in this case, of course, is the way to, uh, to spot the, the, the real person. Huh? So uh, the, if you, if you summarize a little bit what I want to do today, and, and you understand why I find it a little bit difficult, because by opposing Lemieux to Mulstock and Bornstein, let's say, you see two different approaches of basically the same problem. Huh? How to get the feeling of these more proletarian classes on one hand, and on the other hand, to show humanity. The uh, solution of uh, Lemieux was to keep a minimum of recognizable clues, let's say, that will make the personage belonging to Quebec society and to Quebec culture and all that. And then to reduce him to almost a pure presence. Uh, and that's what I call a kind of metaphysical approach. With Bornstein and uh, Mulstock, you have the opposite. They, they reduce, they remove all characteristic, let's say, of the epoch of the nation and of the language and all this, all this disappear. And on the other hand, the face are very much characterized. They are very much individualized. Huh? And indeed, you could say, well, both were risking something. In the case of Lemieux, he was risking too, to be too general and then to be cold and to be uh, difficult to, uh, to relate to. And in their case, maybe it was be too individualistic and I think they found, each one in his way, a certain balance between these two demands. And uh, to create, in fact, uh, an image of the proletarian class will be also an image of humanity. Okay, so I finish with it.